country times three. So that says something about our resilience. In Saskatchewan, in four years, in 2020, it's estimated that indigenous population will be 50% of the province. So things are changing in our country, and that, to me that's incredibly exciting. And part of what's changing is the stories that are emerging from our writers. There's so many books that are available written by indigenous authors and storytellers today. To me, it's very exciting times. So just wondering if there's any other questions at this point. Please. Um, what audience are you trying to reach when you wrote Hope, Faith, and Empathy? Okay, thank you. It's so fascinating to me because when I wrote Hope, Faith, and Empathy, who I was writing it for was adults, mostly non-indigenous, between 50 and 80 years of age. I never imagined it for young people. And I wrote it for that age group as a very gentle door opener. There's very little in here that is traumatic. There's many of our stories out now today that tell, you know, some of the, I, I see you, I'll get you in a moment, that tell some of the hard, hard stories of our people. But I wanted to write Tilly as a gentle door opener that people would begin to be more curious about our history and see our resilience so that then they'd read the next books. So what I haven't shared with you was that when Tilly came out in 2013, it got nominated for an award called the Burt Award, which is a, a national award for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit literature. And there was four books nominated. And so my mom and I went to Winnipeg in September 2014 uh, for the Burt Award celebrations. And that evening, after sitting there for two hours watching incredible entertainment of young people, they announced who the three finalists were. And they were myself, Fertilli. They were chief bestsellers in her beautiful book, They Called Me Number One. It tells her experience in residential school. And Thomas King's book, The Indian Being an Indian. So I was like, wow, Tilly's got third in my mind, right? Because look who I'm up with. And they called the three of us up on stage, and they announced chief bestsellers for third place. And I was like, wow. So there I stood beside Thomas King, who is six foot seven, <laughs> right? So the two of us, I didn't even come up to his shoulder. And I'm thinking, yeah, that Tilly's got second place because I'm standing beside Thomas King. And if you've never read any of his work, please do so. He's one of the most prolific and gifted storytellers and writers of our generation. And then they announced him for second place. And when I first kind of realized what that meant, my first conscious thought was, don't pee your pants. <laughs> right, because here I am now, oh my gosh. And one of the most beautiful things was I could see my mom way up in the back there standing up crying, right, because she'd been part of the journey. She'd seen what it had taken to actually write the book, as those ancestors had said. And so I never imagined it for young people. And as part of the award, 2,500 copies go to our schools on reserve across the country, friendship centers, and then high schools. And that's how it's gotten into high schools. And now it's on many of the grade 10, 11 reading lists across the country. So it's really interesting. You know, I always think, I think it's, you know, when we have the courage to show up and to be present and to be seen and to put something out to the world, like a book, for example, or a song, or a piece of art, your art that's out here that you did with Terry, all these pieces, not only it do, does magic begin to happen and things unfold that we could have never, ever imagined, but also it opens doors for other people to do the same, to have the courage to do so. Had that professor at UVic not said to me, I look forward to reading your book one day, Maybe I wouldn't be standing here. I have no idea. Had that woman said, oh, I have a neighbor who does something with books. Had I not been generous of spirit and given her a copy? Who knows, I might not be standing here today. And next year, there's three books coming out. So I feel incredibly blessed for that. I just want to share with you a little piece around writing. So when we put books out into the world, people are like, oh, you're going to make all this money. So for every copy of Tilly, which sells for $20, how much do you think I make as the writer? 5%. 5%, very close, it's 10%. For the first 10,000 copies, so $2 a book. It's just gone up to 12% over the last year and a half because of selling over 10,000 copies. 
for my heart fails, I get 5% and the illustrator gets 5%. And this book sells for $10. So I get 50 cents a book. So you have to sell a lot of books in order to make a very healthy living in order to raise especially two children in Victoria. No, the illustrator does that. So the cover of this book is also one of the pages in here, and it's my heart fills with, ha with happiness when the sun dances on my cheeks. So that's how this cover comes about. And this cover, I was in Granville Island shopping one day in one of the little stores, and I saw a note card that had this dragonfly on it. It was a bit of a different, it was almost the young man in front of you, almost that shade of turquoise. And I loved this dragonfly. And so I asked the publisher if she'd contact the illustrator to see if we could use it. And so it is a young woman from Cowichan. Um, her last name is Simone. And she at the time was 22 when we bought the rights to use her dragonfly on the front of Tilly. So all, and what's also interesting is when the first copy of this came to me, the cover was gray. And I said, how can we have a book about hope and resilience with a gray cover? Because when you're in the bookstore, when you're in the library, your eyes gravitate to certain colors depending on your mood and what you're looking to read. And gray is often not a cover associated with hope or resilience or high, high vibrancy. So as the author, depending on your publisher, you might have some impact or none. Okay, thank you. So in Hope, Faith, and Empathy, Tilly doesn't end up in a relationship at the end. And so, and she'd had a bit of a tumultuous relationship with that gentleman she saw going into the AA meeting. And so one of the things Barbara Pulling, you remember the editor said to me was, we might want to think about having a different ending if we're doing a book about hope and resilience. Maybe having an ending where Tilly works through some of her relationship challenges and falls in love. Not so it wraps up in a neat basket, but to show that when we do our work, good things happen. And so I agreed with her. And so I came home to my partner and I said to her, her name's Rhonda, and I said, this is what Barbara suggested. And, and she's like, well, what do you think about that? I said, I agree. And she said, well, are you going to keep it, you know, fairly, fairly much our story or not? And I was thinking about the demographics of that population, 50 or 60 and up, especially in some parts of our country where I travel. We, we're blessed living in Victoria and in British Columbia. In many parts of our country, there is still incredible homophobia. And so I knew that if I wrote that book with Tilly ending up in a lesbian relationship, that there would be many people who wouldn't read it because of that in our country. Keep in mind, again, this was five years ago. And so I made a choice, because what I wanted was people to begin to read and understand our history. But what was interesting was the character that Tilly ended up being in a relationship wouldn't show up. I did all kinds of things. I made offerings, I offered prayers, I made food offerings, and he wouldn't show up when we went to Albuquerque. And I thought he'd show up there, he still didn't show up. And then one day I was at my desk writing, and literally I knew exactly what kind of character he needed to be. He's very much like my partner, Rhonda. And I knew exactly where in the book he needed to show up and the symbolism of him opening the door for Tilly to walk through. So that's one of the major differences, and that was the decision behind that. If I was writing it today, would I do that? I don't think so. And that's how much I think I've changed over five years and how much I think our country has changed over five years. Please. Uh, Yes, thank you. She's asked, does the dragonfly on the cover symbolize anything? There's a chapter in the book actually called Gatekeepers to the Dream World. And in the teachings that I've learned, the, the dragonfly actually when we see them, they're like a symbol and a, and a door opener or a gatekeeper to the dream world. 
that they remind us to pay attention to our dreams, not only the ones that we have at night when we're sleeping, but also the ones we have for ourselves. So that's why the dragonfly's on the front. Thank you. Does that mean our time's up, Gail? Very close? <laughs> Love you, Gertie. So I want to do a, a little bit of a giveaway here. So those of you, so Ian, yeah, I'm going to ask the first question about drinking. Please come down and have a cup of tea. Thank you for your question and for speaking out. For the question about the dragonfly and the importance of paying attention to our dreams, thank you very much. Thank you.
show. Please do. Sure. Yes, you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Were you in the class? And I did it. Yes, I remember you. I'd love to remind me your name. Yeah, no. Uh -huh. 